You already know what a top 10 list is, and you already know what a villain is. Let's just go. This is the introduction song. It's not very good, but it's not too long. Okay, in all seriousness, real quick, I do want to put out a very fast spoiler warning for all of these series that are listed here, uh, in no particular order, uh, because there will be, you know, massive spoilers up until the endings of all of these that I'm mentioning, so if that bothers you, then just be aware of that. Starting off the list at number 10, we have Sauron from Lord of the Rings. Now, the thing about Sauron is that he isn't really that great of a villain. You know, he's just kind of power-hungry, and especially in Lord of the Rings, because I know that there is, you know, more backstory and everything for him in, like, the Cimmerillion, but in Lord of the Rings specifically, he is just kind of an evil dark overlord, and he's not even a particularly powerful or intimidating one because he's just in the background. He's more of an event that the characters have to stop than he is an actual person or thing that they can fight against. But what makes him good enough to be put on this list, I think, is how he has just inspired basically every epic fantasy villain ever. Like, Lord of the Rings is what started epic fantasy, and Sauron is what started the epic fantasy Dark Lord trope. You know, the very powerful dude who sits up in a tower and sends out his minions and is just impossibly powerful. And sometimes this trope is done well, sometimes it's done poorly, but the fact that Sauron was able to start it off and has able to maintain his relevance in the genre as the progenitor of this character archetype, even after uh, almost 70 years, yeah, I think that's worth something. So, yeah, Sauron's on the list. Coming in at number 9, we have Galbatorix from the Inheritance Cycle, aka Aragon. Now, a lot of people over the years have derided Aragon for being just like uh, Star Wars in Middle-earth. And I'm not saying that they're wrong, because yeah, it, it basically is. And following that logic, Galbatorix is basically the Emperor Palpatine of the story. You know, long time ago, before everything began, he overthrew this powerful peacekeeping magic force, which in his case was the Dragon Riders, in Palpatine's case it was the Jedi, and now he rules over this empire with an iron fist, and now a good guy, a new magical Force, which in this case is Aragon, a new dragon rider, and the other one it was Luke, a new Jedi, is coming along with, along with a rebellion to try and overthrow him. And in both cases, the character just kind of stays in the background until the final entry of the series. Palpatine, we don't see him for the first two movies at all. And Galbatorix, we don't even see him until about halfway through the final book. And so, it's difficult for a character to leave any sort of presence when they're not even on screen, Galbatorix manages to do that. See, unlike with Palpatine, we get a pretty good rundown of how Galbatorix overthrew all the Dragon Riders. He only had a handful of companions with him, and they were able to defeat hundreds of other Riders. So we know right off the bat how unimaginably powerful this guy is. And even setting that aside, we see uh, his other really powerful minions, like Durza the Shade, and like Murtaugh when he becomes a Dragon Rider later. And these guys are crazy powerful. They almost kill the main characters at multiple times, and we know that they're only really following Galbatorix because he was able to force them into submission. So, as time is going on, he's being built up more and more in the reader's heads as someone who is just impossible to overcome in any way, and how are the good guys going to beat him? Oh my god, is this even possible? And so, he's more of a presence than an actual character for a long time. And then when he finally shows up, he makes good on all those promises. Okay? He literally can command all magic. Like, he can make magic stop working or stop working correctly when other people use it. He can make it work however he wants. And I've already said before that Aragon is my favorite magic system. This is one of the reasons why, because this guy found a loophole and can now it is basically a demigod. He can control everything in existence. And so, when the main characters finally beat him, they don't beat him by just being more powerful or by outsmarting him. 
they have to beat him by finding another loophole in the magic system. And in this case, it's just casting magic without using any actual words, which is not really a loophole, I guess, but it's more a, a way of using it that no one ever does. And they make him feel all the pain that he's caused. And so for just a few moments before he dies, he's like, what the shit? Oh, God. I did all that. That was awful. And then he dies. And Galbatorix was not a particularly deep character. You know, he, he just kind of wanted power for power's sake, and we get a little bit of personality from him because we see, yeah, he really is just crazy. So, yeah, he's not like someone who thought he was doing the right thing or anything, he just was a crazy evil bad guy. But he had all the power to back that up, so it still works. And, even setting all that aside, after they beat him, there's still several hundred pages of the last book left. Because, guess what? Just beating the bad guy doesn't mean the damage he caused went away. Like, all the Dragon Riders are still dead. Like, Aragon is trying to refound it, but that's going to take a lot of time and a lot of effort, and he has to leave his homeland forever in order to do that. The political situation is completely destroyed, and it has to be rebuilt back up. Uh, the human lands have been split into multiple kingdoms, uh, and their ties with the elves and the dwarves and the Urgles are completely wrecked. So, just because he's gone, well, the characters still have a lot of work ahead of them. And a lot of people have called Aragon childish before. They've said it's just aimed at kids, and yeah, it kind of is, but really, when you think about it, the fact that just defeating the bad guy didn't automatically save the day, and the heroes still have to fix a lot of problems he caused, well, that, that's a very mature way of looking at things. And so, for the reason that all of his machinations, all of his evil doings, uh, lasted long after his death, Galbatorix belongs on this list. Number eight is Jake Featherston from the Southern Victory series. So, for those unfamiliar, the Southern Victory series is an alternate timeline story. I've mentioned it a couple of times on here. It's all basically about the Confederate States of America winning the American Civil War and becoming an independent nation, and then it goes for like another 80 years of history, all the way up until the end of World War II, just seeing how things would change. And Jake Featherston, at first, is just one character among many. He's a sergeant in the Confederate Army, during World War I. He, he's fighting against the United States, and at that point, he doesn't seem that unusual. He's very angry, very racist, he's an ultra-nationalist, he's a very violent person, but he doesn't stand out all that much, because a lot of other characters in the series are also that. But then, as time goes on, you realize he is meant to parallel Adolf Hitler. Because this series is alternate history, it has parallels with real history, and Jake Featherston is Adolf Hitler. But you don't realize that at first. Because you go all the way up through World War I, and he's just, you know, he's just this angry soldier. Then, once you start getting into the interwar years, and he's being involved in low-level politics, and he's uh, making all these speeches and stuff, it starts to move into place, and by the time he has taken control of the Freedom Party, and by the time he gets elected Confederate of the CSA, and by the time he starts perpetrating the Holocaust and everything, you realize, oh, this is... this is who this is. And so, while you never exactly feel sympathetic for him, you don't realize exactly what kind of monster he is until much later on. And even by the end of the series, he is kind of a crazy person, yes, but he doesn't go the full Hitler route where he just kills himself in a bunker. Featherston actually wants to continue the fighting, and so he tries to take his plane and fly off somewhere where he can do that, but it gets shot down and he winds up getting killed by a band of partisans. And so, even in the end, he, he wasn't able to let go of his madness. He was still this angry, bitter prick that just wanted to wreck everything good in the world, and... Well, that's something. Number seven is the T-Rex from Jurassic Park. Now, 
I'm pretty sure all of you already know what Jurassic Park is. They made an amazing movie of it in the 90s with, you know, Steven Spielberg and all that. It's, it's a great movie. I think that the book is a little bit better because it, it is uh, fairly similar to the movie. You know, the basic idea of people going to an island with cloned dinosaurs and then stuff goes wrong and they have to, like, run away from the dinosaurs. That's the same in basically both things. But the book adds in just a few extra scenes that really cements the T-Rex as being great, in my mind. Because the thing about it is, it's not a complex villain, okay? It doesn't have a complex plan, it doesn't have complex reasons for wanting to do what it does, it's just a wild animal that wants to eat you. And that strikes a primal chord inside humans, because guess what? We don't like to be eaten. Okay, our ancestors had to deal with that, and so we're afraid of it today. And even setting that aside, it's this giant fucking lizard that can and will kill you if you're not careful. And without rambling too much, there's basically uh, two scenes in the book that the movie didn't have that just make it the best thing ever. So the first one is when Dr. Grant and the kids are uh, getting in a raft and they paddle down a river and the T-Rex is chasing after them when that happens. Because it turns out T-Rexes can swim in this. They swim like crocodiles with their head over the water and their tail just swishes back and forth to push them. And then, after they escape that, later on, they're about to go over a waterfall and they notice that a T-Rex is standing at the bottom of the waterfall with her mouth open, ready to catch them. Seriously, if you haven't read the book for Jurassic Park, go do that, it's amazing. But, yeah, I think those two scenes alone cements the T-Rex as one of the best villains ever. Number six, the Sphere from Sphere. So this is the second Michael Crichton book that I'm putting on here, and it, it's also the last one. And just like the T-Rex, the Sphere is not a complex villain, except at the same time that it is a complex villain. So basically, for those of you unfamiliar with Sphere, because it's very underappreciated, the story revolves around humans found this ship at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. It's a spaceship, which was not made by any human nation, and it's also been there for about 300 years. So they get, you know, some scientists and stuff together, and they send them to this base at the bottom of the ocean, and tell them, hey, take a look at the ship. And so they look around in the ship a little bit, and they realize it was made by humans. But it was made many hundreds of years in the future at some point, because stuff in it is written in English, and they find uh, the American flag on there at some point, and it, so it's human technology. They don't know how it got there. At some point, it just went back in time. They don't know what happened, and they never find out what happened. But on the ship, they find this big orb, like, bigger than a human, and that was not made by humans. Somehow, the ship picked it up and brought it back to Earth, and somehow went back in time, and we don't know what its purpose was. We don't know uh, how it got here. We don't know how it got back in time. We never find any of that out. But the sphere itself is unimaginably powerful. Because when people mess around with it, it gives them power. It gives them power to summon infinite numbers of fish, or to summon giant storms without even realizing it. And in the end, the main characters realize okay, we have this power, but we need to make ourselves forget about it. So that's what they do. They just use it to make themselves forget about it. And we never find out what the sphere's purpose is. We never find out if it's malevolent. It could be. We don't know. Uh, or if it's just curious. It could be. We don't know. We don't know if it's sentient or not. We, we don't know. And in this way, the sphere itself is not that scary, but what it represents is scary. It represents the vast, unknowable nature of outer space, and how humans should maybe not mess around with that too much. It's similar to the great old ones in all of H.P. Lovecraft's work. Like, yes, this is this unimaginably powerful thing. You should not mess around with it. Number five, we have St. John from Rotten Ruin. So, I mentioned recently that Rotten Ruin is a pretty good series. You know, it has its issues. And it is like, you know, a, a zombie story, and a lot of people are just not interested in those anymore because they got oversaturated in the past ten years, but Rotten Ruin is still 
a really solid, really good series. And a big part of the reason for that is St. John. Because in these types of zombie stories, the main villain is almost always a human or a group of humans. And I, I can't exactly say why that is, but that is the case. And the thing is that usually it's just like a group of thugs or a group of bandits or something, or some sort of like tin pot dictator who just wants to take things over. St. John manages to break that mold. Because, unlike them, he is just fucking crazy. Before the apocalypse started, he was a serial killer. Okay, he went around chopping people up, and he managed to avoid getting caught. But then the apocalypse happened, and he saw all these people not only dying around him, but people dying and then rising back up and then killing others. And so when he saw this, he was just confused. He didn't know what to do. And so he started talking to the god of death, Thanatos, because, oh, guess what? He can talk to the god of death, apparently. And eventually he decided that, oh, okay, Thanatos is trying to kill all the humans and bring their souls into the void, where they just don't exist anymore, and they're free from suffering. And around this time, he also rescues a church full of young kids, and he realizes, oh, yes, okay, Thanatos is telling me not only to do this myself, but to bring in followers to do this. And so he raises those kids up to believe this shit. And by the time the main series rolls around, he has an entire army of people called the Reapers, who they just go around and kill all the humans. And they're not doing it for any sadistic reasons, they're doing it because they really sincerely believe that this is the right thing. And besides their big army, they also have a way to kind of herd the zombies and control them and to prevent themselves from being attacked by them. So yeah, they're a bit of a threat. And even though we learn that a pretty big portion of the Reaper's army are not people who believe in all this, they're just people who didn't want to get killed and so they joined up themselves, or, you know, they were like just psychos or thugs or something that wanted to have an excuse to kill people. Some of them are like that, yes. But the core group of, like, St. John and all his lieutenants, they sincerely do believe everything they're saying. And the only thing that kept St. John from being higher on this list is his embarrassingly bad ending, because in the end, the main characters manage to surround his whole army and get them trapped in this area which is just soaked with, like, a diesel and gasoline, and the main character tells him, hey, if you don't surrender, I'm gonna set this on fire and kill all of us including ourselves, and the thing is, the Reapers who don't really believe what they're saying, I can believe that they would surrender in this case. But St. John and his inner circle, his inner circle also surrenders, and they were supposed to be the ones that were, like, the true believers. And then St. John himself is so in anguish by this that he commits suicide. So, yeah, his ending is just embarrassingly bad, but up until that point, fantastic. Number four is Taryn Santoro from The Young Elites. Now, a while ago, I read and reviewed the first Young Elite book, and overall I just kind of thought it was fine, except for uh, the ending, because the climax was really good and took it in an unexpected direction, and the main villain, Taryn. And I have since read uh, the other two books in the trilogy, and I, I will like review them all as one lump, probably in my next uh, review compilation, so... If you want to know my full thoughts, I'll, you'll get them at some point. But Taryn was the only, like, legitimately fantastic part of the first book, I thought. Because in this world, in this story, there was this sickness that went around called the blood fever a while ago. And that killed most of the people that it infected. But the people that survived, most of whom were kids, they became marked. And they became what's known as malfettos. And the marks uh, were different for everybody. Some of them had changed their hair color, some of them it was just like a big blotch on their skin somewhere, almost like a birthmark. Uh, sometimes it would like change the color of their fingernails. It was kind of weird. And a couple of them, not all of them, but a couple, got like these weird powers too, including most of the main characters. And while, while this happened, one of the people who became a Malfetto was the prince of a country called Kenetra. And the prince, his younger sister, wanted to become queen. So she managed to find Taryn, one of their childhood friends, 
and convince him that the blood fever was a punishment from the gods, and that the Malfettos were being marked as abominations by the gods, and so they all needed to be killed. And Terran was already extremely religious at this point, and was looking for reasons as to why all this was happening, so it was pretty easy to convince him. Oh yeah, and also he's totally in love with the queen, we, or princess, we can see that from our perspective, but not as obvious from his. But anyways, and so she's able to convince him to kill the head of the Inquisitors, which is like religious police in their world, and take over himself and make them into a much more hardline military organization. And then they exile the prince, so the princess becomes queen. And then he goes around killing all the Malfettos. And just like St. John, Taryn, you can tell, believes wholeheartedly that what he's doing is right. And it really does make sense when you see his backstory. It, it makes sense that he would be so religious. It makes sense that he would see this huge disaster as a punishment from the gods. And it makes sense that he would be in love with the princess. But the thing is that because she's just manipulating him for political gain, there starts to form a rift between them. And so by the end of the second book, he's started to realize, hey, you're not here to cleanse the world. You're just here for your own power. And he eventually kills her, but he immediately regrets it. And then, in the final book, which I know this might sound confusing, but I don't want to summarize them in too much detail, in the final book, he has to team up with the good guys in order to save the world. And in this could have wound up coming across as really cheesy, because, you know, that sort of thing happens a lot. Like, the good guys and the bad guys have to team up to fight a greater threat. But the thing is... In most of those instances, it feels like the bad guy is only doing it because he wants to live. It, it feels like, you know, oh, I'm gonna die if I don't work with the hero, so fuck it, I'll work with them for now. But then we can go back to trying to kill each other. But in this case, Terran always felt that he was saving the world. He always felt that he was doing the right thing, so it makes perfect sense that he would do this. And he's also trying to kind of atone for his sins because... One, he killed his girlfriend, and two, guess what? He himself is a Malfetto. And so, up until the moment he dies, you can tell that he is very happy with what he's doing. It's not easy on him, and he feels tremendous guilt over some of it, but he's happy that he's able to do it, and he feels he's doing the right thing. And even without all of that, he's still just a very powerful, intimidating force, okay? Every time that... Well, not every time he's on screen, but every time he shows up and you know he's about to kill somebody, the tension gets ratcheted up. So, even though The Young Elites overall is not a particularly great series, I don't think, Terran is legitimately an amazing villain. Number three, Winston Duarte from The Expanse. Now, the thing about Winston is that he doesn't actually show up in the series until seven books in. He's mentioned a couple of times before that, and we see the results of his actions before that, but we don't actually see him until pretty late on. So what makes him work is not like Galbatorix, where he himself is just insanely powerful, but rather we see what his actions are even before we see him. So before he even shows up, he manages to steal a huge portion of the Martian Space Navy. He manages to get a huge portion of the personnel to mutiny and to follow him, and he does it without getting caught. And then in order to cover up his tracks, he gives a bunch of weapons to terrorists and has them throw asteroids at Earth. And when the asteroids hit, they kill... We don't get an exact number, but it's literally billions of people dead. And then he just goes off to another system and starts a colony and starts sending out a message saying, don't come here, don't mess with us. And for the longest time, the humans of the rest of the various colonies and the solar system, they don't bother with him because they don't feel he's worth the effort of going after. But they always feel like they could if they wanted to. And then, 30 years later, he comes back with crazy advanced alien technology and takes over all of human space. Like, all the billions of people, the 
hundreds of solar systems that we've spread out to by that point, he takes all of it over, completely. And it's not even really difficult for him at this point, because he's been preparing for it for so long. And while all of this is going on, he is undergoing treatments to make himself immortal. Like, using some weird alien technology, he is trying to make himself undying. And he doesn't want to do it for anybody else, except for his daughter, which I'll get to in a sec. He doesn't want to do it for anybody else, because he feels that he needs to be an absolute ruler. He needs to be here in order to guide humanity and to protect it. And he knows that he can't trust anybody else to keep doing it generation after generation, so he himself just wants to be immortal. But he's also making his daughter immortal because, guess what, he's a hypocrite. At the end of the day, he's just a tin pot dictator who's trying to justify his own existence. And granted, his character arc isn't completed yet because there's still one more book out, but unless they really drop the ball, St. John style here, I think he deserves the number three spot. Number two is Isha Mile from The Wheel of Time. So, for those unfamiliar, in The Wheel of Time, time is cyclical. You know, when, when somebody dies, they always get reincarnated, and whenever an event happens, it's going to happen again in a similar way somewhere down the line. You know, it's a, it's a circle, or a wheel, if you will. And every couple of thousand years, the Dark One, who is just this unfathomably powerful evil god, um, is going to try and escape from his prison, and if he ever does it, he will destroy the world. And Ishamayel looked at this, and he said, well, we're going to have to try and defeat him over and over and over again. And even when we defeat him, he's still going to come back. Whereas, if he wins, which he will eventually because he has an infinite number of tries, but when he wins, that's game over for us. That, that's the end. So no matter what we do, it's going to end up the same way. And after coming to this admittedly correct conclusion, Ishamayel just decided to serve the Dark One. He said, you know what? I can speed up the process. I can rule for a little while before everything gets destroyed. Let, let's just do it. And so he became the leader of the Forsaken, who are the Dark Lord or the Dark One's most powerful uh, lieutenants. They're his most powerful human allies. And over the course of thousands of years, he does all kinds of heinous evil shit that you would expect. Not because he particularly wants to, but because he feels it's necessary. And because well, he's kind of a nihilist. He doesn't see the, the point in trying to protect things because eventually they are going to all be destroyed. And while he is correct in the sense that eventually everything we love will die, everything we love will be destroyed, he's wrong in the sense that that makes things not matter. And by the end of the series, he kind of realizes that he's wrong. Because just like life, his world is going to end in the same way, eventually. Just like life. Every life ends with us dying at the end. But that doesn't give you an excuse to give up. And Ishmael himself seems to realize this by the end of the series, but he's so far gone that he just can't bring himself to try and get, get away from the darkness and to just give up. So he continues to fight with everything that he has to free the Dark One. And even setting aside the fact that, you know, he's, he is correct. You know, even setting that aside, and the fact that he's pretty obviously got some depressing mindsets and you feel kind of bad for him, he is just insanely powerful. Okay, that this guy is on about the same level as Rand by the end of the series. Okay, he knows way more about channeling than anyone else alive. He could like, destroy mountains and cities if he wanted to, but he doesn't want to. He doesn't want to kill everybody himself because they'll just be reincarnated, and then if that happens, well, they're still suffering. He wants to free the Dark One and just end it all. And that's... well, that's kind of sad. Before we get to the number one spot, here's a couple of honorable mentions. Honorable mention number one, Harathin from Elantris. Now, Harathin is interesting in that He's never really trying to kill the good guys. 
In fact, he's actually trying to protect them, because he knows an army is going to come and invade them in just a couple of months if they don't convert to the proper religion, and so he's trying to get them to convert to that religion. And he does some uh, morally questionable things while he's doing that, but he doesn't do anything that's just straight up evil. And in fact, by the end of the story, he is actually fighting to protect them, because they're going to get killed anyways, and, well, that's never what he signed up for. So, overall, Rathen is genuinely just a good person trying to do the right thing. He just is in conflict with the main characters, and so for that reason, I'd say he's probably Brandon Sanderson's best villain. Next up is Flag from The Stand, and keep in mind, I'm only referring to Flag in The Stand here, okay? I'm not referring to the way he fits into the wider, like, Stephen King expanded universe. Like, I know he's also the villain in The Eyes of the Dragon and in The Dark Tower, but just in The Stand, everyone is, like, dead. Almost everyone in the world is dead. And there's very few supernatural elements to the story there. Except for Flag. Because while most of these people are, like, you know, normal, going about their uh, post-apocalyptic lives just trying to live, Flag actually can do magic. And we don't really know the limits of this, but that just makes it even creepier and more mysterious, and therefore better, because, you know, he's a villain. And we also know that he just gets some sort of sadistic pleasure in causing pain to others. Because while most of the people, most of the survivors are gathering up to be, like, you know, just normal people, Flag decides to gather up all the crazies. All the serial killers, all the murderers, all the schizophrenics, all of them, and he's going to try and get them to kill all the other people and just rule over his kingdom of madmen. So, yeah, Flag's cool. Then there's Cthulhu from the Lovecraft mythos, and the thing about Cthulhu is that, like I said before, the Great Old Ones aren't really scary because of what they are, but rather what they represent. And so I could have put all of them on here, but the thing is, with Cthulhu, even if you're not familiar with Lovecraft, you know what Cthulhu looks like. You've seen that tentacle face before. So, kind of just like Sauron, where he's just so prolific all across his genre, Cthulhu is so prolific that I think he deserves a spot here too. And then there's Ari from Maximum Ride, uh, the original trilogy of Maximum Ride, by the way. So Ari is just a kid. Okay, that's the thing about him. He's just a kid who is horribly abused and subjected to nasty experiments which turn him into something that looks almost like an adult. And then he's just sent to fight the main characters, and he has an unhealthy way of dealing with everything. You know, he's overly violent all the time, and he seems to like fighting people, but again, he's a kid who's in enormous pain, and he just wants to spread it around. And later on in the series, we see that. We see how he wants to try and connect with Max because he feels that she will help him with his pain, and later on, even after that, we see that he tries to become a good guy because he thinks that'll help, and at the end, he does die, and it's not really done in a heroic way so much as he's a victim and we feel bad for him, but he was a victim who tried to make the best of his circumstances, and his entire character growth feels very natural, and if you want to see a more in-depth look at that, then just watch my Rise and Fall of Maximum Ride video. But basically, Ari is just... you feel so bad for him the entire time. And finally, the number one greatest villain in all of literature so far is Lord Loss from the Demonata. Now, I know the Demonata is not a particularly huge series. A lot of you have probably never read it, and a lot of you have probably never even heard of it. The basic idea is that there are an infinite number of universes out there, and each of those universes is also infinite. And the one we live in, with Earth, is, you know, it's infinite. And, you know, you can go out in space, and there are other sentient races out on other planets there. But we don't have the technology to move around that way. And the majority of the other dimensions are full of demons. And normal demons are bad. But the rulers of the demons, the demon lords, are called demonata. And they are unfathomably powerful. 
to us, okay? They mostly spend their time fighting amongst themselves and torturing demons, and occasionally some regular demons will manage to, like, drag humans into their dimension and they'll, like, torture them and play with them for a long time. And sometimes they'll come into our dimension and they will just wipe out entire planets of other sentient races because they can do that. And among the demonata, there's one who is unusual because he likes to visit humans a lot, and his name is Lord Loss. And the main characters of the series all have a special connection with him at the beginning of the series. And I won't get into all that right now because this is already a long video as is, but he, they all have perfectly good reason to hate him. And whenever they manage to beat him, which isn't very often, it's only by outsmarting him. It's not by being more powerful than him because we are less than insects compared to one of the demonata. But as the series goes on, demons manage to open, like, much bigger portals onto Earth, and so just many demons are coming in, killing bunches of people, and Lord Loss appears to be one of their leaders. And at the very end of the series, the main characters manage to get a hold of this weapon that they think will help them win. And a portal is opened, which lets in more demonata, and we see then that while we are less than insects to Lord Loss, Lord Loss is less than insects to these other demonata. Okay, he's, he's nothing compared to them. And so, they try in vain to fight them, and it doesn't work. But then, they dis destroy the entire universe and rebuild it. And when they rebuild it, they rebuild it without Demonata, except for Lord Loss. Because Lord Loss manages to manipulate them into just killing all the other powerful demons and allowing him to rule over all of the demons of all the dimensions for all time. Now, he's not a complicated character, I don't think. He, he doesn't have reasons for doing what he does other than that he gets some sadistic pleasure from torturing and killing people and all that. But even among villains on the rest of this list who do have complex reasons and who are very powerful, Lord Loss won. Okay? None of the other de villains I mentioned here really won at the end of the day, except maybe Spear. Lord Loss was able to overcome demonata who are older than time itself, okay? They've been around since before the Big Bang, which was 13 billion years ago. He was able to overcome them and defeat them and become the ruler of their kingdoms, okay? He was able to overcome and defeat the main characters who destroyed the entire universe and then rebuilt it. And he did that not by being more powerful, but by being smart. And so, Lord Loss won. So let me know down below what kind of villains you like the most, and what ones you think I should have put on here, and whether or not I should kill myself, because that th those pop up now and again. Uh, thanks for watching, thanks to my patrons, especially Apo Salvalainen, uh, David Martinez, Christopher Hawkins, Joseph Pendergraft, and Melanie Austin, and all the other names you see here, because you guys, you guys are great, let me tell you. And uh, if you've watched this far, then you should definitely rate, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you next time. Bye.